the Kings have now lit 40, count them, 40 beams this season as they get a massive win against the Suns. That keeps them in second place, but I think more importantly, gets them separation from the fourth seed in Phoenix. They light that beam, and they did it through great bench play. This game was all about the bench. Not a single person on the team scored over 20 points, and it was Barnes leading the way with 19, but the bench was awesome in this game. And the Kings, they came out, and they got torched in that first stint. Absolutely torched. They couldn't guard Booker. Booker had 10 in, in the uh, early in the first quarter. And the Kings were down like 11. And then Mike Brown went to the bench. And they, he went to two guys specifically. He went to Davion Mitchell. And he went to Kessler Edwards. Two guys who absolutely changed the game defensively. They came in and totally changed the defensive intensity of this game because the starters came out and they it was they just looked lazy and sloppy on offense it was a very weird start a very sloppy start and then those two guys came in off the bench and totally changed the game Kessler Edwards was locking Booker up and both of them just totally changed the defensive intensity and actually led us to a pretty good defensive half. And Kessler Edwards was the big star in this game. He had that really good game against Minnesota to lock up Anthony Edwards. And then he didn't get really any minutes after that, but he he got his chance today and he made the most of it again. So this is he's had two chances and he's been incredibly good, incredibly impactful in both of those chances. And it's really nice to see a guy who I was very excited about the Kings getting, but, you know, it's it was one of those moves where it's like you're getting a guy that probably won't play when you trade for Kessler Edwards, a guy that, you know, I, I tend to get really excited about getting a guy like that in these small trades, and they don't tend to have that big of an impact. And so I knew to, like, temper my expectations this time, but I really shouldn't have because he really has been exactly what we've needed him to be in a 3 and D wing. And he's what we thought or hoped we were getting with KZ Akpala, and he is performing, and he hit a massive shot. He hit two threes in this game, but he hit a massive three to put the game away. And I turned into Mike Breen on that playing that play, Screaming bang after that shot, which I had never done before. That just got me so hyped, that Kessler Edwards 3. And, I mean, he needed to shoot it because you can't be out there passing up wide open looks, especially when they're doubling Fox late in a game. He needs to be able to space the floor in that situation, and he did. This was a very competitive game. I thought the Kings did a good job of limiting Aiton early, and maybe it wasn't so much the Kings, but just Aiton missing. He missed his first couple of mid-rangers, and that kind of... Well, we saw what happened last time when he hit his first couple of mid-rangers. He didn't miss after that, right? But in this game, in that first half, I feel like him missing those kind of took him out of the offense, and that was big because, yes, the pick and roll worked at times, and he would get a dunk, but he wasn't killing us from the mid-range, which was the most important part. Obviously, there are still improvements that need to be made defensively, but I think we've this game was actually showed improvements because the Suns have three great scorers. Even Chris Paul can score, and obviously he had a million assists. But Chris Paul from the mid-range can score, but... The Kings were actually able to limit that this time. And they just looked much better defensively in their rotations. And there were more possessions where they rotated well. You know, not just a few in a game like we usually see. But there was actually a good amount of possessions where there were good rotations, good help. Not letting them just get an open mid-ranger or layup. And obviously they got a few, right? Like, that's going to happen. But, I mean, same can be said for 
the other way around where we got a few just easy kind of pick and roll, pass it to the roller, he gets a layup, right? It, it happens, but it happened way less than it normally does and, and definitely way less than last time we played Phoenix. Going to the offensive side of the ball, uh, Sabonis, I thought, had a really good game getting inside. Aiton fell for his shot fake so many times. It was so funny to watch throughout the game, him just fall for shot fake after shot fake. You knew it was coming every time. But the funny part is, is then in the fourth quarter, when we were up by two late, Sabonis goes to that shot fake against Aiton. Aiton didn't fall for it. Aiton didn't fall for it that time. And Sabonis still scored on him with a little baby hook. Sabonis was huge late in this game because Fox wasn't really able to go into like full takeover mode in the fourth quarter like we see. Fox was a little off all game. He went 8 for 22 and you know he knocked down a couple mid-rangers but his mid-range wasn't like automatic like we usually see and he really wasn't able to get to the rim very well. And so it was a lot more pick and roll with Sabonis and actually finding Sabonis on those rolls and Malik Monk was doing the same thing pick and roll with Sabonis, trying to find Sabonis, and Sabonis was scoring and was big inside in that fourth quarter. And then a few guys hit big shots. Barnes hit a big three late. Davion hit a big three late, and, and I'll get to him because he had a really good game. And then obviously Kessler Edwards hit a big three. Malik Monk, uh, his quarter was the third quarter. And he was actually he was good in the fourth quarter as well because he was playing over Kevin Herter and but but in the third quarter Malik Monk got it going hit a few threes oh and it, I forgot in the fourth he also hit a three he banked it in a transition three where he was like leaning forward like running into it so you knew it was going to be long but it was it was so long that it went in off the glass that was that was awesome. But Malik was great in the third quarter. He caught fire from deep and ended up having uh, 18 points and was a team high plus 20 in this game. He really was very good. And I think he's a little underrated defensively. And maybe I'm saying that because he's replacing Kevin Herter, who gets just scorched sometimes defensively. And I guess I'll talk about that now. Kevin Herter and Keegan Murray did not play late in this game. Keegan Murray had 15 minutes. He had zero points. He was minus 16. And it showed, it, you know, plus minus, like I kind of always say, it's not always, you know, a, a tell-all type stat. But in this case, it is. Like, Keegan Murray was terrible in this game. He started the first half. Obviously, he's a starter. And that it was when he came out that the team started rolling in those because he couldn't defend Booker, he couldn't defend anyone. And then he started the second half, which I was actually surprised about. I thought Mike Brown was going to make a change to this, the starting unit. I thought he was going to start Kessler Edwards in the second half to defend Booker. He didn't, and he kept with the starting five, and it went about as you expect in that we lost the lead very quickly. And... Keegan, I don't think he played from there. I mean, he, he couldn't hit a shot. Uh, he had a chance to hit a three, uh, an open three in that third quarter. And once he missed that, you kind of knew he wasn't going back in the game because if he's not giving you anything offensively, then you can't play him because he is just horrible defensively, right? I'm, I mean, it, it was really bad. He had one block on Booker help side, but when he gets isolated, there's no chance. Josh Okoge went right by him on a play, and that's kind of when I thought it might be over for him for the game. Okoge went right by. I mean, it was embarrassing. It was he he got blown by so badly that Keegan just like kind of gave up trying to even guard him and just like went and tried to find someone else to guard. <laughs> but it was too late to switch, and Davion couldn't get in front of him. And then you know he set up Malik Monk to get posterized there. Kevin Herter is slightly better defensively, but still bad, uh, still getting blown by, especially in kind of half transition when if no one's in the paint, it, it doesn't matter who has the ball. If they see Kevin Herter in front of them and the paint is open, they are going to go right by him into the paint. And so that's why neither of them played late in this game. 
And I think in a, in the playoffs, Keegan Murray is is not going to get nearly as many minutes as he has in the regular season just because he can't defend one-on-one well at all. I think Kevin Herter will probably, I mean, it depends on matchup, but Kevin Herter will probably uh, still maintain a good amount of minutes. But yeah, I, I don't really see Keegan as a rookie getting playoff that many playoff minutes. He'll probably still start. But I mean, you could start Kessler Edwards depending on the matchup. And obviously Keegan, he can catch fire from three. He can give you a lot. And, you know, at times can be okay defensively. But then at other times you see this and and he just had to get benched because of how badly he was getting beat. And a lot of it is just, you know, matchup problems where he has to get switched on to a booker or someone else because of how dangerous the Suns are offensively and how many weapons they have. I can't even imagine if they had Kevin Durant. It would be even worse, right? But it forces him to switch on to guys and, you know, maybe in a different matchup, it's better for him. But this specific matchup is really bad. Going to a more positive note, Davion Mitchell was awesome because I already talked about him coming in and having an impact defensively, but offensively, he was also great. He was five for seven from the field, two for four from the three-point line so he's taking threes with confidence made a big one in the fourth and then but I mean what I love to see was multiple times attacking the rim he attacked like three separate times you know which is three times as many as we normally get we normally get one Davion attack but uh, he went to score three times he even attacked the rim more than that trying to play make out of it I thought he had a great offensive game and I mean him being able to come off the bench and do that really elevates this team because we need that offensive, that other offensive guard off the bench. Trey Lyles, the other guy off the bench, who was awesome, he came out, hit a couple threes, and then even was great later in the game. He had 13 points. You never see him getting exposed defensively, or at least very rarely. So just... I mean, another, that's nothing new for him. That's just another solid game for Trey Lyles. I mean, two guys, Kessler Edwards and Trey Lyles, who are were just like sneaky acquisitions at the trade deadline this season and last season with Lyles by Monty McNair. Just sneaky acquisitions that people probably didn't think much of, but here they are contributing big minutes and closing the game, both of them are. And then Metu was solid. Um, he had a few bad moments. He, he usually does. But he was solid scoring the ball. He had a couple of steals. Well, actually three. I remember two in the fourth quarter that led to uh, breakout opportunities. One of them he dunked. I can't remember what happened on the other one. But he was getting to the free throw line attacking. And that was the, a thing that the Kings did as a whole was attack and get to the free throw line a lot in this game. Fox had two free throw attempts. He missed both of them. And we still uh, went 31 for 37 from the free throw line. It was Sabonis getting 10 free throws. Barnes 6. Herter 4. Metu 5. Monk 5. A few other guys getting to the line. I mean, everyone, every single player that played except for Keegan Murray got to the line tonight. Also, one moment in this game that was huge was the challenge from Mike Brown when Davion got called for a charge, which was a horrible call, and it was an you know easy overturn, and he got the and one on that. And that was huge because I think that tied the game after he converted the and one, and then the Kings went on to you know take the lead again. I don't know if they ever gave it up, or I think maybe they gave it up in the fourth. I can't remember. They, uh, yeah, they probably did. But I thought that that was a big moment to like not let the Suns start getting momentum and start building a lead. And so that was a really good challenge by Mike Brown, who I have been critical on his challenge usage. I think he's had some dumb challenges recently, but that one was a good one. I thought Fox in this game was settling a little too much and not really going he was a little slow like uh, he never turned on the jets to go to the rim but 
you know, he, he really just couldn't, like, figure out how to get to the rim in this game. And he settled for six threes. He went two for six, which is, you know, fine. But he definitely struggled to get to the rim. But the fact that we still won with the bench picking up the slack is huge. I mean, against the Suns team that doesn't really have a bench anymore. The only guy off the Suns bench that gave major contributions offensively was Terrence Ross, who was on fire at portions of this game. Um, and then the other guy who played big minutes off the bench was Ish Wainwright, and he was not good from three. Went one for six in this game. And so that's big for the Suns, where it's like they need they need someone going off the bench kind of other than their big four when Kevin Durant is playing to, to you know, hit threes. But when they don't have Kevin Durant, it seems like they need like two guys to get going from three a little bit. And I mean off the bench because Okogi was three for six from three and he was fine. But like Torrey Craig was not good. He missed a few crucial free throws and was 0 for 4 from 3. And that's how you have to play the Suns. Give those guys the three-point opportunities and they if they make them, they make them. Not not really Terrence Ross cuz Terrence Ross can catch fire, but you have to give Okogi and Wayne Wright and uh Tory Craig those open looks cuz it's just pick your poison with this Suns team. And I I guess I haven't talked about Harrison Barnes much other than him hitting a big three late. I thought he had it going, like, I can't remember when, but during a stretch of this game, he got it going where they just kept going to him. They kept feeding him. He had Booker on him at one point, Okogi, like, no one super big or strong on him, um, and he was just dominating them in the post. He was able to get position, we'd throw it over to him, and he would just score in the post, and he did that a, a few times in a row. Went 6 for 10 overall on the game, and like I said, 6 free throws, went 6 for 6, and had 19 points leading us in scoring. And he's been pretty good, like putting up points in these last uh, few games. And he always does it just in his quiet way. We'll just kind of score throughout the game, maybe have one little burst of getting inside and just knows how to how to score when things aren't going well and, and when we need him to kind of slow things down and get to the basket. And then one play I didn't talk about was that we were up four. Fox gets the steal. Minute and a half maybe remaining, right? You're up four, minute and a half. And Sabonis pushing the ball two on three. He passes it over to Kessler Edwards. And Kessler just like takes his eyes off it. You know, he's thinking about how he's going to finish or pass it to the corner. And he just, he just drops the ball. And the Suns go the other way. And... Get it to Aiton, who's wide open for the layup, and then Fox Fox comes in and for some reason fouls him. Like, what are you doing there? I don't know. Gives him an and one. And so it was a moment where it's like, we should be going up six. Now it's a one-point game. Definitely trying to throw it away a bit there. And, and that happened, like, similar things happen where just, like, not good decision-making or just really bad plays happen in... in like the past couple of games down the stretch, but then the Kings have just been able to bounce back from those moments and win anyways. And like the ultimate bounce back was Kessler dropping that pass, but then hitting the pretty much game ceiling three. So he pretty much immediately just made up for that mistake. The Kings now play their next one at home. The Last one at home before a four-game road trip to the East for the most part. But they are at home playing the Milwaukee Bucks. The Bucks, uh, maybe the best team in the league. But they have been without Giannis, I think, a few games now. So it'll be interesting to see if he plays. The Bucks just lost in overtime to the Warriors tonight. They were in San Francisco. And they, I mean, they are, no matter... If, if Giannis is playing, then they are almost impossible to beat. Like, I, I have them as probably title favorites. If they're, if they're healthy, I, I think they're title favorites. And, but if they don't, 
then they they're obviously very beatable, but still a a very good team, but just very beatable. And I mean, you saw in that Warriors game, they had a big, pretty big lead with like two minutes to go, and it took Steph Curry being Steph Curry to win it in overtime, scoring a crazy amount of points late. But that Bucks team is just they're deep. They are insanely good defensively, right? With Drew Holiday, when, when you have Drew Holiday as your point of attack guy, and then Giannis and Brooke Lopez in the back line, like two of, like they, those three guys, you could argue that they are the three best defensive players in the entire league, all on one team. Brooke Lopez is making his case for defensive player of the year. And uh, I mean, <sighs> That's just, that's impossible to score on. Whether Giannis is playing or not, it's probably going to be a struggle to score in the paint with Brooke Lopez in there. I don't think it will necessarily be that big of a problem for Sabonis because Sabonis can muscle any guy in the league out of the way pretty much and and get to his shot. But for like Fox getting inside and, and guys attacking, it'll definitely be tough. And so you'll probably need to see... Uh, a good amount of three pointers or middies in this game, and then defensively, I mean, I don't even know how many games in a row Drew Holiday has killed us. Drew Holiday, he kills us every single time. So it's just like, please just stop him. But they have a lot of weapons offensively. Obviously, Chris Middleton, who's been dealing with like injuries all season, but he's back. And has been playing, I've seen him coming off the bench a lot. I don't know if he's been starting recently. But I, I can see in this game, Brooke Lopez going off from deep. Because I think the Kings struggle with getting out to centers who like to pick and pop. And so that's something that they need to focus on, I think. And, and get those rotations down of maybe helping on to Brooke Lopez if, if he's pick and popping and then rotating around that. I mean, I've seen so many times this Kings team struggle with stretch fives like Nas Reed killing us every time, leaving him wide open. I could see us doing the same thing with Brooke Lopez who can knock down threes at a very good rate. Brooke Lopez may be the most underrated player in the NBA. You know, it seemed like the schedule got tougher after the All-Star break and it did. But it just, the Kings, they don't care. They're just going to keep winning 8-1 since the All-Star break. Of course, you know, the one game that they lose is the one I go to. But that's fine. They've beaten some good teams. Obviously, New York and Phoenix, the latest of that bunch. And so this Milwaukee game maybe doesn't mean as much. And because you, they got some easier matchups after that. Even though they are on a road trip, it's Chicago, Brooklyn, Washington, Utah. All teams that are either under 500 or, in Brooklyn's case, traded the players that made them over 500. So hopefully we can get a good amount of Ws there and maybe even go for 50 wins. They need to go, I think, 10 and 6. I think they have 16 games, so 10 and 6 to get 50 wins. That's just a crazy statement to be able to say that, that they could get 50 wins. Anyways, that is it for this episode of the Royal Report. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you're listening to the audio version of the podcast, make sure to leave a rating and a review. You can follow me on Twitter at underscore the Royal Report, and I will see you guys next time to recap the game against the Milwaukee Bucks. Peace.